Hi, welcome back to Science on Trial and Error. I'm Kasia Kuzmich-Kowalska. I'm a PhD student in developmental biology at IST Austria and the host of this podcast. I'm very happy to finally return with new episodes after our unexpected long break. I had to take care of my health and it took a while for me to recover and feel better. Hopefully now things will go more as planned. Still, because the end of the PhD is even more busy and stressful, and I have to look after my health more carefully, I decided to change the frequency of publishing of the new episodes to every three weeks. This should allow me to keep the schedule even in case of emergencies. Okay, so we have a lot of exciting guests coming, and there will also be a special episode. I've been interrogating my guests for long enough and it seems only fair to give them and you a chance to ask me some questions. Episode 15 will be featuring me spilling the truth on my scientific adventure, my future plans and many, many other things. If you'd like your question to be answered, please contact me via email scienceontrialanderror at gmail.com or through the social media channels. I will also collect questions from Twitter and Instagram. And now, let's dive into today's episode. My guest is Vivian Jonas. Vivian comes from Austria and she's a PhD student in biology in German Cancer Research Center, DKFZ, in Heidelberg, in the lab of Dr. Wey. She is currently investigating the interplay between transcription and DNA damage in neuroprogenitor cells. Prior to her PhD, Vivian got her Master of Science degree in Drug Discovery and Development at the University of Vienna and her Bachelor of Science in Molecular Biotechnology at the University of Applied Sciences in Vienna. Her previous research experience was centered around cancer research. She also did a semester of studies abroad at the Institute of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology in Reykjavik in Iceland. Vivian began her PhD right before the pandemic started And it only made the experience of moving abroad to study more difficult. When she started her Instagram account at science.viv, she just wanted to share snippets of her life. Now, with more than 12.5k followers, she has a strong community interested in her life as a scientist. And she is there to be honest about the great experiences and cool science and about the difficulties and hardships. She's also very committed to bringing more attention to mental health issues in academia. It was very easy to talk to Vivian, even though we discussed quite a bunch of difficult topics. Her energy is contagious, and I'm sure you won't even notice how fast the time will go when you listen to her. So grab your coffee or tea and enjoy Vivian talking about her exciting research work, her decision process when applying for PhD program, her further career plans and views on leaving academia, and her scientific crashes. As usual, we also cover what could be improved in the scientific world and share some personal stories. Please enjoy Vivian Jonas. Thank you for joining me today on the podcast. Yeah, it's nice to see you finally, face to face. Yeah, <laughs> I'm also happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> Getting ready for my vacation. I need to still pack and all that, but yeah, things are going well. How's the weather in Heidelberg? Foggy and cloudy. <laughs> That's going to be the next couple of months, I guess. Uh, at least right now it's not raining. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good thing, always in the fall. It's actually yeah. sunny in Vienna, which is quite a pleasant surprise. So I like to start the interview with asking people about their music at work. And I know from your stories that you do listen to music at work. I actually checked out your playlist on Spotify. What kind of music works best for you when when you're working and do you make like special playlists for different things you do or is it more like a monthly thing that you do so actually to be honest <laughs> i cannot really listen to my own spotify playlists because i don't have the premium account 
<laughs> what? Really? No, so I have Apple Music, but because everybody I else see. uses Spotify, I made the uh, playlist on Spotify. So most times in the lab, we just listen to a local radio station, mm -hmm. which, I don't know, plays the same songs over and over again. <laughs> It's so bad. But when I'm in the cell culture for many hours, which I often am, I listen to hardcore EDM, so there's like a little festival in my ear. <laughs> okay. It keeps you awake, I guess. Yeah, and motivated, because otherwise I would die. <laughs> yeah, it can it can be very long. And also, you know, just the hoods, and when you sit there, it gets into your head as well. Yeah, and they are so loud. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Okay, so let's start talking about your work. I'm very excited about this. You are... Currently a PhD student in the German Cancer Research Center uh, in Heidelberg, right? Correct. It's DKFC, I think, in, in German. Yes. <laughs> you are currently, correct me if I'm wrong, are you in your second or third year? Yeah, I'm currently transitioning next week into the third year. <laughs> okay, so I was kind of getting close there. Yeah. Do you work with uh, Professor Wei? Dr. Wei. And you are doing very interesting research. You are looking into the interplay between transcription and the DNA damage. And you are doing this in neuroprogenitor cells. How about we start with talking about this? Maybe you can give a brief overview of your project in the simplest way you can. <laughs> let's, let's start with this. Yeah, basically, when the brain develops, as you know, as a developmental biologist, <laughs> uh, in the beginning, there are only a very few cells. And then in the end, the adult brain has 80 billion cells. So how can this happen? There are like this um, stem cells and then differentiate to the neuroprogenitor cells. And this happens very fast and they need to divide quite fast. And during this fast replication, there might be some problems in the cells because this is very stressful. And this is what we call replication stress. So it can come from lack of nucleotides or oxidative stress. There are like many different forms of replication stress. And this induces a lot of DNA damage. And one of the DNA damages that we look at in our lab are double strand breaking in the DNA. And here with our standard assay, <laughs> we are checking for translocation, actually, because if there is a translocation, then there was a double strand break before that has been repaired. This is important because the genes where we see this happening very often are all involved in like cell cell adhesion and synaptogenesis, so crucial for neuronal efficiency. They, they need to work properly. Yeah. So also these genes have been seen to be altered or have copy number variations in cancer or neuropsychiatric disorders. So your work is entirely in vitro? Right, you have exactly. uh, models in cells where you differentiate the stem cells into neuroprogenitors, and then do you induce the stress on the cells to make it more uh, exactly. easy for you to observe these events? Okay, how do you induce the stress in the cells? So most of the groups or like labs that work on this use aphidicoline. This is an inhibitor of the DNA polymerase. So then the replication fork becomes stalled. And this, if it is stalled for long enough, leads to replication fork collapse. And then how do you actually trace the damages to the DNA? Do you have to take out the DNA from the cells to look at it? Or can you look at it in the cells using some markers and very... I guess, good microscopy? What are the methods to do this? I mean, there are also quite some people who do this with microscopy and check for uh, gamma H2AX um, because this is a DNA damage and double strand break uh, marker. But we actually use a sequencing method. So after I'm done with my experiment, I extract the DNA and prepare libraries, which we can then send to sequencing. I mean, there are the double strand breaks that we induce with the aphidicoline treatment, but we don't know where they are. So the, the main idea is to use like a bait prey approach. So with CRISPR, uh, we introduced a double strand break on the same chromosome quite nearby the genes that we are interested in. And then because they are quite in close proximity, if two double strand breaks are quite close to each other and uh, the DNA repair is not very efficient, it will lead to a long-range deletion, and this way we can figure out if we know the sequence of the 
CRISPR targeting site, what's joined on the other side. That's very cool. So how do you choose your candidate genes that you look at? You said they are involved in synaptogenesis. Did you screen the literature and choose something that is interesting? During the postdoc of my PI, she was already working on this project and they actually did it with cells they got from humans or mouse. So neuroprogenitor cells, like a mixed population. And they found these very long genes, which are transcribed and late replicating, seem to have these characteristics of showing this enrichment in double strand breaks. These recurrent DNA break clusters are these genes. And there is now... I don't know, 150 or more. And I just checked which of them are like most prominent. And right now I'm working on a, one that is highly transcribed and one that is lowly transcribed and checking if our hypothesis stands up. So the hypothesis would be that if it takes long for the gene to be transcribed, it increases the chance of this to happen. I guess you are also thinking that the level of the transcription matters as well by looking at the high and low transcribed genes. It seems that it doesn't matter too much, at least from the data that is right now published. But we, we still need to do further experiments, of course. No, but the, the general hypothesis is that when these long genes are replicated, this might take actually just, if you calculate the speed of the DNA polymerase, uh, longer than one cell cycle. Okay, yeah. So this is weird already. So the, the hypothesis is that if the transcription machinery and the replication fork kind of conf conflict with each other and there is a collision, that then a double turn break is likely to happen. I see. It's really interesting. I mean, you are looking at the cells that are present during the development. So it's like very early on when the brain is being formed, way actually before the neurons are even produced. And you are kind of expecting that these effects would then have longer lasting effect in the adult brain. Mm -hmm. And I guess you are also looking at the connection to, to cancer where the processes get kind of reversed, right? Are you planning to check also some cancer cell lines for these events or how do you connect it? I mean, I know that cancer cells start to proliferate more. So there's this connection to the speed of proliferation and the rearrangement of the cellular systems for replication. But yeah, how would you connect these two things? Yeah, so actually it's not 100% connected <laughs> because my project is like very basic science. But there are, of course, other projects in the lab which are complementing my work. At the moment, my work should mainly focus on figuring out why it happens and where it happens exactly. So is it transcription initiation, elongation or termination, which leads to these problems? But yeah, that would be actually a really easy experiment to just treat some cancer cells with a and generate the libraries. We can definitely do that. <laughs> So you have a lot of different methods that you need to use. You have to, as you said, edit the genome with CRISPR and you mm -hmm. have to also do the sequencing. So it's like a very wide range of methods that I guess they're not super new, like you don't have to establish them from scratch, but you still had to learn really a lot in your, yes. in your PhD. <laughs> um, yeah, I was wondering how did this work for you? Were you learning from other people in the lab? Did you have any, any problems learning the techniques and how did you actually overcome them? Yeah, so actually the, the learning curve was really steep <laughs> 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 because I, I, I worked with cancer cells before, but uh, culture cancer cells is so easy. Yes, I know. They you, you, grow regardless what you do. Like, they are just exactly. so persistent. Whatever you do, you can use cold medium. They, they don't care. They will grow anyway. But the embryonic stem cells are very high maintenance. They just die very easily, right? Or differentiate, which is even worse. <laughs> so I screwed up so many cell experiments in the beginning, of course, um, because you just need to be there every 24 hours and change medium or split them and take care of them. But yeah, I learned it. Yeah, I think the first half year was like super stressful because I learned all of these new things. And also what I think made it a little bit more challenging was that when I came to the lab, my PI already did some of the experiments. She showed me like little bits and parts, but not in the chronological order. 
So we started like with some library prep and then we had neuroprogenitor cells and then we had fibroblasts and then suddenly we also had embryonic stem cells and I was super confused. Yeah. Because I was like, how are these things connected? Yeah, of course. <laughs> but then I understood, okay, everything that we did is actually connected. It is all one big experiment. But yeah, in, in the beginning, it was quite hard because it was only the PI and me and another master student. That was quite fun. Yeah, as you said, it's a learning curve and PhD is definitely challenging in the sense that you have to really learn a lot. But on the other hand, you grow so much during this time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was wondering, how did you decide to go in this direction? Because as you mentioned, you worked before with cancer cells. And you actually did your master's in drug discovery and development in Vienna. Yeah, I wanted to know why not going into a bit more translational direction for your PhD and what made you decide to go to Heidelberg? How was your decision process in this? Originally, already for my master's thesis, I also interviewed with Böhringer Ingelheim which would fit the, the study program that I actually uh, was involved in. But they asked me like, okay, what are your further plans? What do you want to do in life? And I said, after this, I would like to do a PhD. And then they were like, okay, then I think you should think again about it. If you really want to do your master thesis in industry, because it would be better if you do your master thesis in academia if you want to continue with the PhD. Interesting, yeah. And I was like, oh, what do I do? But then I also found a master thesis in academia, which was very nice. Yeah, and then I just continued with the, the PhD route and I was applying five different programs. Yeah. And then I was invited to two different ones in Heidelberg. So the EMBL and also the German Cancer Research Center. But somehow already during the EMBL selection, I had the feeling like, okay, this is nice, but actually I would like to do something with cancer because I just have done it before. And this was like giving me a purpose in some way. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Then two weeks later, I came to Heidelberg. I interviewed with, I don't know, three or four labs. The thing is, They are like these two different entryways into the DKF set. So they are like this interview process and you kind of get a score and the 18 best get a graduate school position. Okay. So it means that when uh, your group cannot fund you or doesn't want to fund you, doesn't need to fund you, the graduate school will pay for you. So you're kind of free for the group. So all of the groups that I was applying to didn't have funding for me because I haven't been shortlisted. So I was then on a waiting list. And then a few PIs reached out to me and some of them were like not really interesting for me. But then my now PI reached out to me and she was like, oh, you, you said in your motivation letter that you would like to learn bioinformatics and also wet lab together. So I'm really looking for one of these people. Can we meet? And I introduce you to my research topic. And this is just like somehow by chance I ended up on this topic because before I had the idea, okay, I want to do either melanoma research like in my bachelor thesis or pancreatic cancer research so this is like a completely new field but I was like everybody's doing sequencing these days it's very useful it's something that I should learn this was also why I decided to join the lab yeah so you mentioned bioinformatics how are you dealing with this have you been taking classes do you have someone in the lab who is teaching you this and do you actually like it because not everyone does Yes, so actually I am like a really <laughs> low level. <laughs> no, the, the, the thing is the pipeline that we use for our standard essay is quite old. And I just basically copy what has been published and follow the, the protocol. So there is not a lot of things that I really learned there. I mean, I can log in into the cluster and copy things from one folder to the other. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, as long as you get the data that you need, I guess this is fine. And you still have some time. Actually, do you have like an upper limit for your PhD where you have to finish? Or is it a bit depending on how the project goes? 
I'm not sure. I mean, now I'm discussing with my PI and we will definitely need to prolong me to three and a half years because three years is just not possible as the first PhD ever in her lab. Um, and also with COVID. I'm not sure if there is an upper limit. I mean, she would like me to finish as fast as possible anyway. I think from the university, they start to get worried or send you like some reminders after five years. So you mentioned pandemics. If I count correctly, it was kind of right after you started, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How how was it? How was it in Heidelberg? Were you able to work? Did you have to take a long break and be kind of st stuck at home? How how did it work? Yeah. So I started my PhD in November 2019. So everything was nice back then. And then I already had a hard time to kind of settle down here because I have no family or friends here. And also I was working quite long hours. So And every day because of the cells. Yeah. yeah. So by the time I started to make friends and meet people, <laughs> everything <laughs> locked up. Of course. <laughs> So that was quite hard. Yeah, so in the first day when it was like, okay, the decaf set is going to shut down, we were like, okay, we need to trash everything. Yeah. So also there, a lot of my cell progress went down the drain. Yeah, but then afterwards, because we're a very small lab, there was a number of people who can come in, even though the whole institute is officially shut down. So I got this waiver and I was then there like half a day. But actually, this was, I think, the most unproductive time. Of course. I mean, not only were you super freaked out, I guess, but also yeah. it's just you can't work properly with all these things that are happening around. Exactly. We were all yeah. having a low productivity period at that point. Wait, let me now jump in time a bit because I want to ask you one more thing about your pre-PhD experience. Mm -hmm. So we discussed a bit your master's and the drug discovery studies. But before that, you're doing your bachelor's. I think it was biotechnology, right? And mm -hmm. you mentioned yourself, you worked on cancer before, you worked on pancreatic cancer and melanoma. And you also had a short stay abroad during your bachelor's in Iceland and you went for Erasmus, right? So I wanted to ask, how did you find this experience? Was it your first stay abroad for science and how did you find yourself in this situation? So actually for my whole studies in Vienna, I lived with my family because we had an apartment and I didn't find it necessary to move if I stay in the same city. Going to Iceland was actually my very first trip to be really independent. So in the, the first days, I freaked out. <laughs> actually, when, when we arrived at the airport, I was like crying. I was like, why did I decide to do this? <laughs> yeah, it can be scary. I, I, I get it. I completely get it. Uh, yeah, and then when, when we arrived uh, in Reykjavik, there was a snowstorm. So I was like, <laughs> why? <laughs> Right into the deep water. <laughs> yeah, so, so the first day I was com completely finished. I don't know, it, it was so horrible. But afterwards it was so nice because also the, the lab that I joined, the, the PI, he's a great guy. I mean, so supportive. And also the, the postdoc that supervised me, she was also from Vienna, so uh -huh. we had a lot of fun. Okay, good, <laughs> good. And I was living in a shared flat with two of my colleagues, also from my university. So there were a lot of people that I kind of knew, but not too close. How long did you stay there? In total, it was five months. Okay, that's quite long. Mm -hmm. And then you liked the feeling of being abroad and you went for your PhD. But you didn't expect the COVID to happen, of course, I know. Yeah. For me, I come from Poland, I come from Warsaw, and I did my studies at the University of Warsaw. So I was living in my childhood apartment my whole mm. life. And I did my bachelor's and I did my master's. And after my master's, I went for a, a, like an internship in Münster in Germany. And it was just mm -hmm. six weeks. Uh, and it was right before I went for my PhD 
in Vienna. So basically, I finished my master's, I went for the whole summer to Germany, and then I moved to Vienna. And this mm. was a lot. Like, suddenly, you are in another country, which is kind of fine. I mean, for me, it was six weeks, so it wasn't super, super long. I treated it more like, you know, like a vacation, in a sense, yeah. because you don't really get root so much. Like, you, you know you're staying there just for a short time. But then I moved to, to Austria, and then... Whew, um, <laughs> I mean, I was lucky because our institute provides us with apartments for the first year. So I was staying not mm -hmm. actually in the city. I didn't have to go through the process of looking for an apartment. I could stay there for for a couple of months, like close to the campus. But this mm -hmm. was also in some sense bad because I was like five minutes from work all the time. So no. I ended up being there all the time, of course. And also it's very remote. The campus is outside of Vienna and there's like nothing close by except for like Bila and that's it so you end up being just either at work or at home and to me this was really not a great period of time like I was not eating no. properly I think I was just kind of winging it for the first half a year now I really like it I really do enjoy it and actually I think living in Vienna is is really really comfortable but yeah this first time when you when you go can be can be scary I know Okay, so how did the love for science start it? Let's go back in time a bit and <laughs> tell me about this. So actually it didn't start with science. When I was a child, uh, my uncle was a mechanic. So I always saw him like screwing stuff on cars and stuff like this. And I was like fascinated with everything <laughs> that I can do with my hands. There's like the story of me walking with my parents in one of the Viennese parks. And there is like a bench and I'm like, mom, dad, look, there's a screw missing. I want to fix this. <laughs> <laughs> so you are really going for engineering aspect of it. Yeah, like as a four-year-old. <laughs> oh, it's so cute. <laughs> so this was like the, the first thing that I liked. But then afterwards, I mean, there are a lot of these knowledge shows in German TV. So like this Sendung mit der Maus. So I really enjoyed them as a child because I was like, oh, I, I want to know everything. And I also had like one of these lexicons where you can read about all the different things. I was always so fascinated. And then during my primary school, we had this collaboration where we went to the gymnasium. So fifth to eighth grade and basically joined them for their chemistry lab. Ooh, cool. And then we did this black marker chromatography experiment and stuff like this. And this was like super fun. I was I, like, yeah. it is so nice, all of the different colors. And I became fascinated with it. So I decided to then join exactly this school where I saw what is happening in the chemistry lab. And also, full disclosure, my mom also back in Romania was doing some chemistry school which was like very theoretically back then. Um, but this was not valid in Austria. So she decided to go for another uh, college. So two years after your high school to get the, the license to, to work as a, what is it? Chemical technician, basically. Uh, and this was shortly before I had to decide, okay, what do I want to go further? Do I want to commit to the general education or do I already want to do something that would give me a job option afterwards? So I actually joined the same school where she has recently uh, oh, finished cool. <laughs> uh, and did like the five years together with the general education. So it was this like chemistry focused high school in, in Vienna. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had a guest, I think, who also went to this school. He mentioned that you then had opportunity to like do a lot of internships and get a lot of practical experience. You probably liked it and that's why you decided to stay in research, right? Exactly. Okay. So I, I really enjoyed lab work. So what did you focus on when you were in the school? Did you have to decide in which part of the chemistry you can go or was it very yeah. broad? Uh, the first three years are like the same for everyone. So you get the general chemistry knowledge and analytical chemistry and a lot of chemistry labs. I mean, back then, they, they changed it many times over since then. You were able to decide between like a more economical focus 
business oriented or a surface technology, something like related to the environment, studying I don't know water samples. And I went for the biochemistry, biotechnology and genetic engineering branch, which then led me to biotechnology, of course. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's cool. I mean, the earlier you get your experience, the better, right? It's easier also to make an informed decision, I think. Because mm -hmm. if you have a chance to do these internships and, you know, get into a wet lab and see how this works, you can much more easily decide if this is what you want to do. Whereas when it's all very abstract, it may seem like a good choice, but then some people, that's why they change their mind, because it's it's just not mm -hmm. working out. As you mentioned, your first ideas were more into studying cancer and doing more of this translational research, going a bit maybe into industry direction. What was the inspiration behind this? As you said, where you're looking for like a reason to kind of serve for the others and it was much more clear with the translational science or, or what was the, the story behind it? Yeah, I mean, you, you always hear like, news where there is some cancer related things and people are always saying like oh why is there no cure for cancer and this was always like in the back of my mind so I was like actually this is like really interesting because I, I didn't know a lot about melanoma and cancer before starting my bachelor thesis but I was like this sounds cool I want to do this <laughs> and then I got into the topic and it became even more fascinating actually <laughs> So this is why I decided to stay. <laughs> and is this actually your plan for the future? Do you want to come back to working more, like bridging the basic science and the translational aspects of it? What's what's the plan for you after the PhD? At least the general. <laughs> this is actually a very good question. At the moment, actually, I believe that I might Uh, leave science um, because I saw like how my PI during my master's was struggling. She was a junior PI and after these five years you have this evaluation and before this evaluation she actually left to get an industry job and I also now see like all of the different things that my PI needs to tackle and I'm like not really convinced. <laughs> so I think it's not something that I want to do anymore i mean it was my big dream for many years but now that i see a little bit more behind the scenes it's not yeah. as attractive anymore the reality is quite far <laughs> from what we thought right yeah yeah it's it's a bit of a sad disappointing thing i think first of all it doesn't depend only on your hard work which is i think the biggest lie because when we start this we think okay if i work hard and i will be committed i will be successful but then yeah you see all these people who do it and then it doesn't always go like this yeah no. this also for me was a bit of a soul crushing experience i mean i still don't know what i'm going to do to be honest but yeah <laughs> yeah so then going into industry but staying still with the medical aspects of it Or not necessarily? Not necessarily. I mean, I was at a few recruiting or, I don't know, meet the company events from bigger, like, management consulting companies. And this is something that I can definitely imagine because they work on different projects one at a time. And then every time it's something new, you can learn a lot. There are new experiences. And I think this would, like, keep my curious mind happy yeah i know i have a friend who is now has now defended and she went into this yeah it seemed like a cool job because if i understand correctly you need the problem solving skills that you acquire during your exactly. phd you you need a curious mind and you kind of need this ability to constantly learn which is also cool because the project change this sounds like a very interesting job and i actually was kind of surprised that they they look for people specifically after phd because they know that you acquire so much experience during this time to find solutions and to troubleshoot and to mm. to deal with different kind of problems because we don't only solve problems with our experiments there's like so many issues on the way yeah this sounds like a cool plan I like the fact that you are so open about it because I think there's a lot of um, taboo around people who don't want to stay in academia. Like people feel mm -hmm. a bit stressed to say it out loud 
because then sometimes you can experience people not treating you so seriously because if you anywhere are quitting then like yeah. going somewhere else then it doesn't really matter so much and then they don't put so much effort i think it's important to discuss that there's so many other pathways and they are like they can be also extremely rewarding even sometimes mm. more i think it's good to to put it out there Okay, so stepping away from the research a bit, I would like to talk about your Instagram account, Science Biff. I really like it. I mean, I, I do enjoy this, this academic Instagram a lot. And what I really do like about your account is that it's a very honest, very open sharing of experiences of your PhD, both the positive sides and also the negative sides. I think it really creates a very committed community because they feel like they can get from you just the honest account of what is happening. First, I wanted to ask, why did you decide to do this? Was it because of the pandemics? Was it something that you always wanted to do? What was, yeah, what was the idea for this? Yeah, so actually it was something that I always wanted to do. But... I put like in the back of my mind for many, many years. Then I remember when I finished my master's, I started off really discussing this more with a few of my friends. And they were like, okay, yeah, th that sounds really cool. Go for it. But then I didn't. <laughs> I don't know when it was. Sometime after I started my PhD, I was actively looking for other PhD accounts on Instagram. Then I think the very first one that I found was Ellie, so my PhD experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And this kind of opened a whole <laughs> new possibility. And um, then I found like many, many others. And after following them for, I don't know, two months, I was like, actually, I had this idea that I wanted to do. Maybe I just go for it now. And that's when I then finally decided, okay, I will give it also a try. If nobody follows me, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, and here we are. How many exactly. followers right now? It's just crazy, girl. Yeah, I mean, it got crazy. These, these reels are like so arbitrary. One of my reels went completely viral. It has like 3 million views right now, I believe. Jesus. So yeah, now now I'm at 11.8 uh, thousand. <laughs> <laughs> that's so many followers yeah <laughs> i mean it's cool because as as i said you get to have this community and i guess you meet different people through it and it's it's a bit of a networking but also it just creates this bond that we are all in this together and you speak very openly also about mental health and about having the proper balance and taking care of yourself during the phd i was wondering if your experiences with being honest have been all positives or has there been any any negatives to it have you ever felt like it's too much or you get some like negative comments from people how how are you finding yourself in this actually um i'm quite lucky because all of the feedback is very positive because people are like oh it's so nice that you talk about this and I'm really struggling to I don't know reach out to get uh, therapy so thank you for putting it out there so at the moment everything was very positive the thing where I sometimes get a little bit of negative comments is um, on some science things when I talk about the drug development process or um, show something in the lab. Really? Okay, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but like me opening up, I think also the, the people who are not interested don't read the whole thing. That's true, that's it's true. Because I, I have like long captions and this is kind of like a barrier. This keeps people who are not interested from reading it and commenting it anyway. I have actually a positive experience with sharing going through your posts and and just yeah following you i noticed that you discuss positive aspects of research you know the curiosity the learning and being challenged but you also discussed how 
you did not expect the PhD to be so difficult. And of course, we didn't expect the pandemics to happen. And, and there are also these moments where our motivation drops and we are feeling very down. And I think it's important to say it because people feel very alone when this happens. And, and you kind of mm-hmm. look around and you think that everybody's doing so well and you're struggling so hard. And that's also one of the reasons why I started this podcast, to get the conversation going that it is real and it happens to all of us. So what I wanted to ask you is, how do you how do you deal with this? You mentioned therapy, but yeah, what else do you do to keep yourself from from burnout, that's one thing, and then to keep yourself in check to maybe not drop so low, to, to have this balance a bit more controlled? Yeah. I mean, I also, in my life already, <laughs> uh, read a lot of self-care books. I don't know, I'm just like also quite interested by the psychological aspect. So I also read something in that direction. But uh, I think in the main part comes from like me seeing that I'm not so good in taking care of myself, that I try to really kind of push and force it on other people because I know that when I wasn't taking care of myself, I ended up very miserable so I'm always trying to keep my friends like no you now leave the lab (laughs) you can finish this tomorrow but yeah also for the challenge that we currently have the self-care challenge I like it the the first thing that I neglect is myself that's the thing it's easier to take care of your friends sometimes than to actually notice that you are not taking care of yourself I admit I have this problem as well yeah, so the challenge is, I mean, also for others, but I think mainly it's for myself <laughs> and try to like come back into this habit of doing stuff regularly and take care of myself because there are like so many things that I just let slip. For example, my fridge is empty. <laughs> I, I, I have like cheese. Very bad. <laughs> cheese. I mean, cheese is good, but come on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I also have this problem like you know we have to do so many things during the week at work and then you come back and you're tired and you you prioritize let's call it prioritizing but it's not really the good way to prioritize so you think okay what do I need to do sometimes food is not on the top of the list sometimes the physical activity is not on top of the list and suddenly it's been a couple of weeks and you're like mainly working yeah and yeah, it's it's really hard. I think we are all a bit borderline workaholics in this research community. There is this external pressure to work a lot that comes from many different ways. There mm-hmm. is the internal pressure coming from us and our guilt to perform the way that we are supposed to perform. And yeah. then there is this, this culture of overworking that comes from the fact that everybody around you works more and then you start doubting yourself like... Am I not doing it right? Am I not being committed? It's it's hard. And I think when you do something like your challenge, if it can help people to feel like, okay, I'm not the only person who think it's fine to leave work and go for a walk or it's fine to leave work early to actually cook for myself and do something for myself, it feels a bit better. Because maybe in your lab, people will not do this. And then you feel like, can I be the only one who does this kind of things? Am I then not, yeah, as good researcher as they are? So I really do think this is good to bring it to people's attention and to have at least this virtual sense of not being alone in this. Because come on, it's a good thing. It's just, it just feels sometimes so weird to put yourself first. And I don't think it should be weird, but it's just... And also rest actually is productive. So if I work like 12 hours a day for a full week, I, I cannot think anymore. But then if I sit down and I have time for myself, I may have new ideas or I just make less mistakes when I'm in the lab. Very good point. This is so yeah. important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the head cannot just work all around the clock. Sometimes the physical activity helps because then you're just, yeah, just, just focusing on something entirely different can help you much more than just sitting in the lab mindlessly and, mm. and being so extremely tired. I completely agree. Maybe going from this, we could discuss what I always bring up in my conversations, which is what could be improved 
in science, academia, research world in general. What do you think is something that is definitely not working okay and that needs improvement, that needs some work, that maybe needs more attention? What is it that is important for you in this sense? So I think especially for the PhD students, there needs to be like more support and also people telling them like, okay, in the beginning of your PhD, you will work a lot, but it's also important to meet new friends and have some connections with others and also talk openly about how you feel. Because also, as you said, like Instagram is this sort of highlight reel where everybody's putting like all of their best selves out there. And this is like so toxic because you cannot be your best self 24 seven. And this is also true for academia and being a PhD student working on a big project for the very first time in your life. I don't know, just like helping people connect with each other and talk more openly about their feelings. <laughs> yeah. And then somehow slowing down everything because the thing is right now, There are so many people who work on the weekends and because one lab is working on the weekend and they might be the competitor, you also need to work on the weekend because you need to keep up. And this is making this incredible hard thing where you don't have time to rest and take care of yourself. Yeah, I think it gets normalized, this kind of yeah, work exactly. on the weekend. And I don't know about you, but when I was going in my PhD, I was told by so many people that it is how it is. You have to be prepared. Like, I was actually warned that it will be expected from me. And I was like, I really like doing this. So, yeah, I can do that. But in my master's, I did it maybe a couple of times. And then the PhD started. I managed to maintain it maybe for two years, working almost every weekend. Mm -hmm. And I always had in the back of my head, then I will finish faster and lie I mean honestly I think I also struggled a lot with guilt because when you start and you're learning how to do things you make mistakes maybe more often mm. and then I was always feeling like I'm behind because I did something wrong so I felt if I come on the weekend I will be again on time yeah I ended up getting sick whether this was related to me overworking or not that's a bit of a open for discussion topic but the thing is now I have to watch out much more and this put mm -hmm. me in check but yeah as I said there's the culture of overworking and people come sometimes with very healthy attitude but then the PI expects you to work on the weekend or everybody else works on the weekend and then there's this pressure from peers mm -hmm. and you mentioned also talking and being open about the experiences I think it's extremely important When there is a grad school program, at least sometimes there are some sort of regulations in place that try to help students. But when the students just come to the university or they come to selected group and there is like no structure, they don't have a batch with whom they started. Yeah. It's very easy to feel like you are very alone in this. And I don't think the PIs have enough training in managing mm. people so that very often even though they are extremely good researchers they mm -hmm. don't know how to help i mean there are also the toxic pis who you know have this attitude i survived the harsh realities so if you survive then you're gonna be good if you don't well then yeah. bye in my program i actually am very happy because we have something that is called mentors mm -hmm. and this is a pi who is not from your field and who is assigned to you at the beginning when you start and it's supposed mm -hmm. to check in with you especially during your first year when you adjust kind of notice if you're showing signs of burnout to help you with any problems you might have any communication issues and just to have someone that is checking on you and I think this is a super good idea because to me it helped a lot it also helps mm -hmm. me even now there's not really a space for people to feel like they can open up all these things without feeling like they are being weak so yeah. the the stigma around mental illness is still super real i think there should be more opportunities to talk to psychologists in the institutes mm -hmm. like this should be yeah. a normal thing yeah it's important to even talk about this i think the more we talk about it the more normalized it will become exactly And also, I think what is also super hard is you need, if you have 
problems with your PI or with the workload, you need to address it with him or her. Mm -hmm. And this is like super hard because you're in this kind of, it's not, it's not really a power play, but as a PhD student, you feel that it is. And <laughs> yeah, so, so I cried many, many times in the office of my PI. <laughs> but, but afterwards, I just felt better because actually communication is key everywhere in the relationship with what all of the people that you have relationships with. And if you're not telling this other person that you're overwhelmed, how can she know? Yeah, that's true. It's important to speak up. It's important to, to ask for help. Of course, there should be structures that can help you. And of course, there can be situations when your PI is maybe not the most understanding person and this may feel like you are in this very weak position. But I think you're bringing up a very important point. No one will know if you don't say anything because we are very good at keeping up the masks, you know? We just exactly. throw ourselves into this pseudo productivity rush and we just go with every day but yeah at some point you get either to the burnout point or to the break point where you just cannot do it anymore no so completely agreed okay let's go away from the sad sad topics and let's talk about exciting things just in general what is it that excites you in science the most right now what is it that you are really interested in? Right now, because my project is kind of focusing on transcription, I started to do this course on edX um, from the MIT on transcription and transposition. And this was just like somehow reigniting my love for science because I, I haven't been in an auditorium for so long and having lectures. And I don't know, the, the professor also is so good. I learned so many, so many new things, even though I, I, I have the molecular biology background. But this showed me like why I initially started doing this by learning more about the different uh, mechanistic processes. I also had a few ideas from experiments. Cool. And so I, by somehow learning some very basic stuff again and having this process of okay i need to answer these quiz questions and watch these lectures somehow it, it got me motivated again that's really really cool i was doing a lot of these courses before my phd i feel like during the phd i lost a bit of mm -hmm. track i feel like the edX and the coursera courses are really such a great resource and especially now i guess in many places of the world still the courses are not taught the normal way or you just don't have mm. the access to it. And I'm so impressed with people who put this work to create them because it's really a lot of work yeah. that goes into it. So are you looking forward to another course? Are you looking for something new? Yes, actually, I think I will do the prerequisite course, which is actually part one because I just started with part two. <laughs> <laughs> so on DNA replication and DNA repair, That's which is also fitting. connected to my field. <laughs> And also this professor, Professor Bell, I ended up finding him in a schedule of seminar that I'm subscribed to from Colombia. So I was like, I know this guy. He presents very well. So I will definitely listen to this seminar. Also, his research is super nice. So I read it together with my colleague and she will present it for a journal club. <laughs> Ooh, so you really went deep into this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but that's super cool. I mean, you, you started with something a bit like far and then you managed to connect it to your work. It's, it's really good. Okay, so now going a step farther from this, hearing about what you're interested in, if you could have unlimited resources and you could do whichever experiments, look into whatever topic that is interesting for you, what would you want to do? So research area or like for my project? We can do either or both, whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, so I think with all of my cancer background and now working with stem cells and everything, I have quite a variety of methods that I learned. And if I would stay in academia or if I would like to really make a change, I think that I would 
definitely continue with some research for endometriosis. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah. Is this because of your personal connection to it? If you don't mind me asking. Yes, also <laughs> because it's just like so frustrating that there is no therapy and nobody knows what's going on and you need to cut people open to figure out if they have it or not. So this is super frustrating. And when I went to the university clinics to talk to them and get the surgery and everything, they were always like, yeah, we have the study going on. Do you want to participate? I was like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and I participated in everything that I was able to because it's just like so, so mind-blowing to me that in 2021, we still know so little about the female body and it's so prevalent you know like it's it's what one in 15 one in one in 10 yeah it's crazy i mean i also have it and in my case you know i was going to a doctor and i was being told that i should see a psychiatrist because it's all in my head and like no. that pain is normal and all these kinds of things. And you really start doubting yourself. And as you mentioned, in many cases, you need to have the surgery to even confirm the diagnosis, which is crazy. So I think this is a very underfunded area. And I mean, it's also more common than cancer, actually. And many women are affected like every month. I think it would be nice to have some kind of more insight there in the next 10 years. <laughs> I, I agree. This, this is actually a really cool suggestion. Yeah, especially the lack of therapy is something that surprises me. They just give you hormones, mm. but it's very blind. No. Maybe it helps, maybe it won't. I mean, introducing a menopause is like maybe not the greatest for people who still want children in the future. I, I definitely agree. This is a hugely underfunded area of research and it's surprising because it's so prevalent. Mm. Hopefully, I mean, hopefully in the next few years there will be a a change in this. Okay, last question. I don't know if you've heard it on the podcast before, but I like to ask the so-called dinner question. So if you could have a chat, a dinner or coffee with someone that you really admire, was an inspiration to you, either someone living or someone that is no longer alive, who would this be? Who would you choose? Mm. <laughs> nice question i think i i answered it multiple times before but every time it's another person that's good <laughs> that's actually this means you are like changing no but i think it would probably emmanuel chapentier <laughs> because before my bachelor thesis i i got kind of obsessed with crispr <laughs> And, and there was a time where I wouldn't shut up about it. I was telling everybody about it. Yeah, I, I just think that it's so cool. And also because she was in Vienna when it was discovered. Yes. So, they, so there is also a connection. Uh -huh. Exactly. It would, would be just so great to discuss everything with her and how she became the scientist that she is today. Yeah. What kind of process of thought went into this, right? It's such a revolutionary technique that changed so much in research i i can i can understand that so you would just ask her everything probably you already have a, like a list of questions in your head that you would yeah but also like what made her become a scientist just knowing about her personal kind of path as well exactly yeah yeah i think we you know as female scientists we are a bit more looking for role models than mm. our guys counterparts in a sense that sure you can find in your field female scientists that are successful but it's mm. not such a big percentage and then to actually even be able to speak to them is, is already a much lower chance mm. hopefully you will have a chance to <laughs> to speak to at least some of your people on your list because i'm sure the list mm. is bigger yeah. and <laughs> And I'm wishing you all the best for your project and for your work. And then whatever you decide, I'm sure it's going to be good because I think you also, after the PhD, you know better what you want and what brings you joy. So just yeah. try to find a way to, to have the parts that you enjoy the most. And I'm sure it will be great. Thank you for doing yeah. this. I really yeah, enjoyed this conversation. <laughs>
Me too. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye.